you'll often have advisors tell you, go ask the customers what they want, build it, and get them to pay for it. But the problem is you've got that first customer has now steered you into a different direction where you're solving their problem. You're not solving the overall vision that you had. I'm going to introduce four wonderful entrepreneurs who are going to bring you lots of value tonight by sharing their experiences and telling you the way it is straight up. So first to the stage, uh, we're going to bring Jamie Schneiderman. Uh, Jamie is a Harvard MBA who's worked for P&G and Coke. He loves eating off the kids' menu and hates giving hugs to anyone who is not his family. I can share that as well. Jamie. Eva Wong is also a Harvard grad. Uh, she's worked at Maple Leaf Foods and the United Nations Development Program, among other places. She loves food blogs and Lemon Square. She didn't bring us any tonight. And she is the COO of Borowell. Ben Zifkin is a huge advocate for the Toronto and Canadian startup scene. Um, I've known thousands of entrepreneurs in my life, and I can say that Ben is one of the greater mensches, one of the greater good guys out there. Very happy to have him on stage with us. Ben is the CEO and founder of Hubba. And last but certainly not least, uh, Kean O'Sullivan. Kean is top dog at a company called Beagle, which is a legal innovation company I work very closely with uh, at LegalX. He's also a fellow at Stanford's Codex, and he's really one of the best pitchers that I've ever seen. I know some other people in this room who can attest to seeing him pitch. He also once watched me beg for a coffee cup at a large Beijing law firm, and they gave me the cup as a souvenir. <laughs> Kean, right. come on up. Yes. <laughs> okay, let's do this. I got a question for anybody on the panel. How many of you have skipped paying yourself so that you could make payroll? Share any details about that while I drop all of my technology on the floor? Uh, how, how many times do you mean? Yeah, how many times? Uh, I think you, I, I, let's see, I've uh, skipped paying myself. I've written personal checks to make sure other people got paid or that we got through what we had to do. Um, I think you just do whatever you need to do uh, to get by. So if you believe in where you're going, you just, you make it work. I'll add a little of that. Um, with, a, with a team that believes in the product, uh, believes in the leadership with the solution, um, with open communication and provided that there's no surprises, uh, your team can be quite tolerant as well to everybody ends up taking a bit of a sacrifice and looking to pay it forward. Um, the, la the last thing your team wants to see you as a founder is overstressed because that actually precipitates downwards. So what I find is a uh, very transparent, uh, open environment, um, and, uh, and throwing all the solutions and options on the table. And it's amazing how everybody will, will, will try to eat the pain a little bit to make it easier for everybody else. Anybody else want to add to that? We don't pay people very well, so it's not so hard. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the, yeah, you, you do whatever you need to do. It, uh, it depends on the stage of the company, which we'll talk about, I'm sure, quite a bit. Um, but everybody does different things, and as a founder, you choose on kind of what that plan looks like. Uh, whether you pay yourself or not, even in the beginning, is, is, not, is a whole other question. Okay, so um, you told me a story once, it was in this building, when you exited your last startup uh, in the UK, and you came back to Canada, you made some pretty important life decisions about the kind of place that you would live, for example, um, so that Hubba would have enough runway. Yeah. Um, do you want to tell the folks in the audience a little bit about that? I think it was a pretty admirable thing you did. Uh, cool. I, I, I appreciate that. I'd like to be admirable. It wasn't about being admirable. It was about hopefully building a good business. And it's very, very selfish. Um, in terms of coming back to Toronto, I, I used to live all over the world. And uh, at the time, I was living in London. and absolutely loved living in London. Um, but in terms of building a, a company, uh, Toronto seems to be, I think, the best place in the world to build a company. Uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is probably what we see in this room and all around us is, is the access to talent. Uh, I always kind of quote this one stat where, you know, all of California graduates about 26,000 STEM students a year, and here, just in Ontario alone, we graduate about 30,000. 
Right? That's a huge deal. And when you're dealing with a fight for talent, especially as a small startup, if you're going up against the Facebooks and Googles down in the valley, that's one thing. Um, but around here, you know, if you're able to differentiate yourself, you have access to some really, really wonderful people. So uh, that was probably number one. And one thing you'll hear about me a lot is, is, is for us, the team is the most important thing. So that was really reason number one why we moved back here. Obviously, the ability to operate a little bit more cheaply than in the UK or in the Valley. Um, the ability to sell a little bit easier into companies that maybe it's the Canadian subsidiary where you do a pilot and then you leapfrog a little into the US was, was a big help, that kind of sales model. Um, but talent was, for me, the number one thing. So it's a little altruistic, which was great. Uh, it sounds altruistic. A lot of it was being selfish. But Canada on its own, I think, needs a few more massive, massive companies. Um, we wanted to build one of those really important, big, huge institutional companies, and we decided to come back here and do it. Eva, what do you think about that? What do you think about Toronto as a global startup hub, as a place to build a really, really successful company? Yeah, no, I think it's amazing. I mean, I'd echo what Ben said. And um, I've had the experience, and lots of people have had the experience of living all over the world and eventually wanting to come back to Toronto. and. Uh, I'd say it's been amazing. Like recruiting talent is, it's just, I think that's one of the things I'm probably most excited about is the team that we've been able to build. And we've got a couple of team members uh, of Bora Well here in the room. Uh, but the co-founders, we all say like that's the thing that we're most excited about. And I think where we have the competitive advantage over for us, um, big banks, we just think that uh, millennials and anyone who like really wants to make a difference is going to choose to work for a startup, any one of these like sort of smaller companies, rather than go to a big bank, and uh, I think that's where we, we do have uh, an edge. Well, I'm not from Toronto, and our company isn't in Toronto, <laughs> uh, but we're just down the road. We're in, uh, in Waterloo, and so I would, I would uh, add to everything that's said, and I would extend it uh, along the corridor. There's an amazing amount of talent and support everywhere from uh, Kitchener-Waterloo, uh, Cambridge-Guelph, all the way up the corridor here. And, um, I do nearly, trips nearly every week up, up to Toronto, and I see a lot of my Toronto friends do the same thing back down. That corridor is very important. It's about the same length as uh, Silicon Valley as well. Uh, if you think about San Fran all the way down to, to San Jose. So, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of comparisons. Uh, we're obviously a lot cheaper. I think we're nicer, too. Uh, but there is, there is really a great source of talent, but it's not just that. It is the support. Uh, it's an amazingly uh, accessible and transparent access to people who've done it and uh, people who have uh, really good ideas on, on maybe how to look at something from a different perspective. So that, that's, that's, that's why I really want to make sure that this corridor is going to be our, our solid home base. Listen, I, I think it's fantastic. I'm glad we're here. Uh, the, I, I, but I would add to this, and I, I, w I would at least caution on a couple things. It's changed over the last few years. Um, the benefits in terms of the environment that you're in, in terms of talent, I absolutely agree with all that. Uh, from a financing perspective, from access to capital, from access to sort of um, a community around that, uh, it is, it is getting way, way, way better than it was a few years ago, but it isn't anything close to the way it is in the Valley. Um, you go to the Bay Area, um, everybody knows everyone. It's very easy, you can be out at any event and there's you know, 100 investors there, they get to know you over time. And when the time comes to raise money, it's a lot easier to make those phone calls. It's totally different. You can't do that here. Here, if you wanna do that, you have to go out there. The one thing that has changed, we've seen it change um, three or four years ago if you went out to the Valley um, sorry, if you, uh, yeah, you went out to the Valley to raise money for Toronto, they look at you like you had three heads. Um, that has changed dramatically over yeah, time. Now it's only two heads. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. uh, no, but, it, but it, it, is, it is much, much easier. It's much more common for um, American investors to come up and put their money in, in, uh, in Toronto in particular. Um, especially, I'd say, I'd say more on the East Coast and on the West Coast, but it is happening more and more. Obviously, the Canadian dollar is a newer phenomenon in terms of being weaker, which makes that some of those investments better at the same time. Um, but just there's a, there's a greater openness. But, I, but that's the only watch out that I would have is that I, I, I think, look, it's, we're here, we love it, um, we're not moving, we've been asked to, and uh, uh, wouldn't happen, but, but that's the one thing that is beneficial about being somewhere like the Valley. So let's jump into a conversation about early stage capital because I know a lot of entrepreneurs and there's a huge range of entrepreneurs here from some really early stage folks that I know to people who built really successful businesses. 
So what about getting early stage capital as a Canadian startup and Canadian entrepreneur? I think we all agree that it's getting better, but let's be realistic about kind of where we are and where we need to go. And if anybody also wants to comment on the role of government and government funds in that, the pros and cons, feel free to go ahead and do so. How are you defining early stage? Um, pretty early. Like seed and angel? I, I would say, given the way that we think about startups today, like between you know, bootstrap friends and family and pre-seed. So way before Series A, and I think way before traditional seed. So more than I have an idea, I've got an, MV, I got an idea, an MVP, some proof of concept. We're starting to get some customers. We need some cash. Well, uh, the key thing you said there, we're starting to get customers. And, and, and sometimes that is the typical Canadian question is, do you have customers? Do you have revenue? Yeah. Uh, th that's, that's actually the problem. And, uh, and Canadians traditionally, from an early onset investment, want to really, really mitigate their position and say, can you actually show me that not only is there a market fit, not only do you have technical or a technical solution, but in fact, the big thing, did somebody go into their pocket, pull out a few dollars and give it to you? That is the big test. And, uh, you know, there's no concept of a napkin or an ideation fund really in Canada. And, and that, you know, is it a cultural thing or not? That's actually a, a big problem because you have a chicken egg scenario and, and, and you'll often have advisors tell you, go ask the customers what they want, build it and get them to pay for it. But the problem is you've got that first customers now steered you into a different direction where you're solving their problem. You're not solving the overall vision that you had. I think that is something that's very weak uh, in Canada, but it's not insurmountable. I mean, we've all been able to, to come across that. And the two key areas are, do you really, really understand the problem and have a reasonable idea of how you're gonna solve it? And does the investor like you, like you personally, you can still sell yourself as an individual who can lead to be able to get to that next step. And I think part of the issue with early uh, raising is that uh, entrepreneurs are focusing more on the problem. They're not doing enough to sell themselves as the p person to solve that problem. And so, you know, it's a, it's a little bit of both. And if entrepreneurs are better at selling themselves, connecting themselves with the problem, then those early investors, they might be a little more willing to, uh, to open up their wallets for a few bucks. So I, I, I agree. I, I mean, I think that interesting, I had an interesting experience actually here. Um, I'm not trying to, I, I think Mars is fantastic, but early days, in early days I had an advisory program, and uh, this, this sort of exemplifies my experience when I, the first time I went, and I sat down with some advisors, and I said, we're trying to raise money, um, you know, we need a few hundred thousand dollars, and they said, well, uh, for sure, if you, uh, if you could just go out and get revenue, then it would be a lot easier <laughs> to raise that money, and I sort of sat there and went, if I had revenue, I wouldn't need the two hundred thousand dollars. Like, uh, this is the like exact. Going to a bank when you need yeah, money, right? Like, uh, anyway, so That's so that, we have Eva. That, <laughs> great idea. I like that. I wasn't there. Wasn't around at the time. Um, but the, but the point. So I agree. I, I think that's that's the one. It's the chicken egg pro problem, and it's something that's got to change here. Uh, ultimately, I, investors, the right kind of investors are investing in people. Um, the right people and, a, and what they believe is a big idea, but it ultimately comes down to people. And I frankly have heard pretty consistently from, um, from VCs that they're investing in people almost right through the A round. So it's not really until this, the point at which you're scaling the business or demonstrating scale on the business um, that they start believing that the business on its own um, is the thing that's gonna take you to the next level. It really comes down to who it is who's running with it. I, mean, I can tell a little bit about the Borwell story, which is um, that we did bootstrap for a while. And so, you know, you need to cobble together a team of people that are willing, whether sort of part time or full time, to put some, you know, blood, sweat and tears and sweat equity into building something and having the idea. And again, you know, putting the team uh, together on a slide and, yep. and selling that story. Uh, and I'd say that in the last few years, there are angels and there are sort of um, sort of seed level investors that are willing to, to do that in order to um, get you to, to that next stage. Um, I think the question is whether, you know, there's a Series A funding to support that. Right. So, you know, you sort of fix one problem in, in terms of some of the seed stuff, and then, you know, there's all this proliferation of all these uh, small 
companies that have seed funding and how do you get to the next, how do you get to the next level? Because then it's, it's way more competitive. Um, and so I think that's sort of the next key that needs to be unlocked in, in the Canadian ecosystem. We're going to intersperse audience questions throughout. So if you've got a question, go up to one of the mics. We'll take a couple questions now um, as we start. And I want to make sure that we don't lose a thread that just came up here, which is about mythologizing what Silicon Valley is. So we'll get back to that in a sec if it doesn't come up in one of the audience questions. Please. So just a quick clarification. I really appreciate your point. Um, and I, I just wanted to be clear. Is that comment about Toronto? Or is, is that something that also holds in Silicon Valley? Uh, in, the chicken and egg problem that investors are not willing to invest. So um, it's not as it's not as bad in Silicon Valley, of mm -hmm. course. There's a bigger net, a bigger network, and there's more competition there to get that get in at that early stage. Mm -hmm. The investment competition and the way that angels look at it in Canada is not trying to get in at that next, you know, that Uber or that Slack or whatever early. It's uh, it's it's a little. Mm -hmm. uh, so it can be easier to capitalize yourself earlier. Um, as, as was talked about, you know, and you find you go to the Valley and you get capital early. The problem, though, is that you also now have a competition with talent acquisition and you can have key employees poached relatively easy and it's very expensive to do business. And we have a long arm list of Canadian companies who went down there after Y Combinator and then after six months or a year packed their bags and ended up coming back. Um, but, uh, but it is more of a problem at that chicken egg scenario up in Canada, yeah. definitely. I appreciate the, the clarification. Thank you. Hi. Uh, regarding that egg and chicken problem that you just pointed out, uh, let's say as an entrepreneur that have a good idea, you're at early stage. You want a, or need some funding in order to go to the next level. But you know that your idea is good. The investors know that your idea is good. How can you not lose a big chunk of your uh, basically shares? for a little amount of money that you need at this point of business, at this stage. Do we have a negotiations expert on the, on the panel? <laughs> Happen too, absolutely. Um, I, I, Go ahead. I was just, so I have, uh, I understand the point about not wanting to give everything away early. Um, I appreciate that. I think everybody has that, and it's a balance. Um, a very wise person who's in the room right now said something uh, very intelligent to me, which is, Nobody ever went bankrupt from dilution, okay? And so the point is this, if you have a big idea and you believe in the big idea, don't get hung up about dilution. Don't get hung up about giving away some of the business. I, I, I think that, I think what you're doing is you're trying to find the right partners and the right capital you need to make that idea come to life. And so what's most important is committing to it. I mean, one of, so I don't want to get off topic too much, but the point is, is you know, you read a lot of stuff about in, the overnight successes on, on startups. Oh, you know, there's Uber and like one day it didn't exist and now it's billions of dollars, unicorns left, right and center, right? All this stuff. It sounds great. Um, I, there, there are very few companies that start and then overnight become a huge success. They get rewritten that way, right? History rewrites itself. Um, even companies like Google, which are massive, didn't happen overnight. It took some time, right? So my, my point is, it's a long process. Get the right people on the train or on the bus with you early in the process. Get the capital you need and then do it right. I, I wouldn't, if it's really that big, if it's really that great, you'll make plenty of money and you'll get it all back and, and everybody will want you to keep going with it. Can I, I I'm going to give you one specific strategy. So. One of the things uh, that people don't do enough of is they don't raise enough cash. Yeah. Okay. And and we actually ran into that. We we tried to go for a little bit here and a little bit there. We didn't group it together because we thought a smaller ask was going to be easier to close than going out for a larger ask, right? And uh, and that that had a, you know a little bit of a ripple effect. And that's one of the things I would have done differently. One of the strategies that you could use if you're going to go out and raise X amount is go to the individual that you look that's going to be the investor and actually say, I want you to commit to 1.5x. So let's say you want 100 grand, say, I need you to commit to 150 grand, but I'm only gonna take 75 right now. And I'm gonna make that, I'm gonna work my ass off to make that go as long as possible. But I know that if I need to go back, I'm not now distracted by finding another investor. 
And so you are now motivated to keep as much capital as possible. And some VCs will say, if you as an owner, as a founder, do not have enough skin in the game later, they're not interested. So keeping a bit of skin is important. I 100% though, don't get over worried about it. But make sure that that first investment, that they are willing to then double down on you. And, 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 that, and that can be quite effective then as well. 